Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, please give us insight that we might understand the things you would have us to understand. Help us, Lord, to to experience your grace more fully every day, that we would walk in it, that we would redeem the time, and that we would please you in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ecclesiastes 3.15, That which hath been is now. That which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. Get with me, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. So one of the themes of Ecclesiastes is that there is is nothing that's new. That which hath been is now, and it will be repeated again in the future. You've no doubt heard some of these sayings, but it's commonly said that the one thing that men learn from history is that they do not learn from history. And, of course, the mistakes of the past are repeated again and again. Go back to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 16. And moreover I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. Verse 16 is making the observation that men's institutions are corrupt. It would be best if the government and the court system and the educational system and and all the different institutions that men have and operate, it would be best if those were instruments of righteousness, but they're flawed. What's the basic reason they're flawed? They're composed of sinful men. One of, the, one of the things that's common to do is to complain about the government, that the government is all messed up. And that, of course, is true. But guess what would happen if they put us in charge? You know what it would be? <laughs> it would be just as messed up. We don't like to think that way. But uh, the fact of the matter is the core problem is that it's composed of sinful men. So what is the scriptural response to that? Get with me 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 1. 1 Timothy 2 verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. The simple fact of the matter is this, it would be better, the more biblical truth our institutions operated according to, the better it would be. So that that would be a positive thing. But they're never going to quite be right until the Lord returns. Until then, they're always going to be be frustrating, and that's just simply sort of the nature of of how it is. Get with me Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 17. I said in mine heart, 
God shall judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time there for every purpose and for every work. Get with me Revelation 20. Are the wrongs that men commit rectified in this life? And the answer to that is sometimes, to some extent. Sometimes the guilty are caught and punished, but often that's not the case. But there is a time when all will be rectified, when there will be a reckoning. Look with me at Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great. Small and great, that refers to not how tall people are. It refers to the kings of the earth and the, the, the noble and the powerful. Small and great stand before God. Then notice what it says. And the books were opened. Books is plural. And another book was opened. So there's books that are open, plural, and then there's the book which is opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, plural. Notice what it says, according to their works. What verse 12 is saying is this. There are books that record all of the acts of man's life. Most of us would hope that those books are inaccurate, poorly kept, and they'd be misplaced, right? They'd be somewhere with Hillary's email. But unfortunately, those books are 100% accurate and comprehensive, right? Look at me at Romans 2. Romans chapter 2. Verse 5. Let's start in verse 3. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? In other words, people have this in the back of their mind that they're going to get away with it. Verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. What happens is God is long-suffering and he forbears to punish sin. But what men often do is they despise that. And then notice what happens as a result of that, verse 5. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You know what happens the longer you live as a lost man, if you never get saved? What do you end up doing? You treasure up wrath. Guess what happens each additional day you live? You sin more, right? And thus what you're doing is you're treasuring up wrath against the day of wrath. I want you to think with me about the natural process of a man's life. So the first thing that happens is a man is born. Now look with me at Romans 7. Romans 7, verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, 
But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When a man is born, he is spiritually alive, according to Romans 7, verse 9. People often talk about an age of accountability. They'll say 18 or some age. And they'll say, before that, you're not accountable for your behavior. When you look at Romans, I don't think there's such a thing as an age of accountability because it's not an age-based thing. It is a knowledge-based thing. Paul says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Look with me at Romans 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Many people think that they're going to please God by keeping the Ten Commandments. You may have had this experience. I've talked to people about the gospel, and they've told me they're keeping the Ten Commandments. Now, you know good and well they're not, right? Among other things, it says, Thou shalt not bear false witness, right? And they couldn't recite the Ten of them anyway. But let's say you perfectly kept the Ten Commandments. Would that mean that you kept the law? How many commandments are there in the law? There's 600 plus, including what threads you can wear in a garment, how you design the roof of your house, how you deal with a bird's nest when you find it. See, what happens is if you actually start reading the law, you realize, wow, I had no idea that commandment was there. I violated that. And you keep reading like I had no idea. The more you read the law, it does what Romans 3.19 says. It declares guilt. The law was never given so that because God expected man to keep it perfectly and therefore man would be justified, the law was given to declare guilt and it contained within it a sacrificial system to deal with man's sin. So here's what I want you to notice. Man is born, he's alive, but then what happens is he comes to a knowledge of the law and what the law does is it declares him guilty. Go back to Romans 7. Romans 7, verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The knowledge of the law makes man guilty and therefore he is spiritually dead. Now here's what happens. The, the next issue in life is whether man believes the gospel. If man believes the gospel, then he's saved, he becomes spiritually alive, and of course we know that he ultimately ends up in heaven. But what happens if a man doesn't believe the gospel? Here's what frankly happens, just think through this. If you don't believe the gospel, every day you live, what are you doing? You're treasuring up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath. That's simply the, the reality of, of how it works. And what Revelation 20 describes is the books, plural or opened. Here's your autobiography in all its gory, gruesome detail. And then... God punishes sin appropriately. Get Ecclesiastes 3, if you would. You know, the Gospels say that man shall give account of every idle word. If you just think of how many dumb and hurtful things you've said in your life, if it was just that, that would be bad. But, it, of course, it's, it's beyond that. What all this tells you is, of course, man's desperate, desperate need for the Gospel. 
and rejection of the gospel is, is spiritual suicide. Ecclesiastes 3.18. I set in mine a heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. What the writer there is saying is, you know what man needs to realize? They need to realize that they're beasts. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. First Corinthians 15, verse 32. Paul says something very interesting. If, now notice what it says here, after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So when 1 Corinthians is written, Paul immediately prior to that was in Ephesus. The way I understand that verse, I don't think Paul was saying that he was wrestling with lions and tigers and bears. He says, after the manner of men. I believe he's referring to the men that he was wrestling with at Ephesus. And it was equivalent, it was the spiritual same thing as wrestling with beasts. Look with me at Acts 19. Acts 19, we'll see what happened in Ephesus. Acts 19, verse 32. So this is when there's uproar at Ephesus, verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. Now this is just fascinating, because there's a mob here, and one part of the mob is crying out one thing, because they think that's the reason they should be upset. And another part is crying out something else as to the reason they should be upset. And what do most of them think? I don't know why I'm here, but it's loud and noisy, so let's go. Do you see how it's just madness? It's just, it's not rational, it's not principled, it's not thoughtful. It's, I'm angry and I'll figure out why, but I I know I'm angry. Look at verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours, cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Now just think about this with me for a minute. If you think about people crying out or yelling or chanting or so on, it rarely goes for more than two minutes, right? If you think of people cheering at the end of the game or chanting something, it it doesn't last two hours right? But there it lasts two hours. That is a picture of what man is like. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, writing by the power of the Holy Spirit, says it's like wrestling with beasts. They're irrational. Look with me at Jude 1. Jude chapter 1. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Get Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Verse 6, a brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. Psalm 94, verse 8, understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? Get Jeremiah 10.
Jeremiah 10, verse 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Now, here's what I want to suggest to you. Uh, we'll get, get one more. Get Psalm 49. Get Psalm 49, verse 12. Psalm 49, verse 12. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perisheth, that perish. Now, let me give you two examples. One is you've probably seen this, but what happens when a town uh, hosts the team that wins a national championship? This happens a lot after the NC2A tournament. What will happen in that town is they'll be basically loud, noisy, carrying on that results in the destruction of massive amounts of property. Have you ever noticed that? Now think about that. <laughs> you ought to be happy, right? Because the hometown team won, and how does it manifest itself? It manifests itself by man behaving just like a beast. I was once on a campus where a, a school had won the national championship that evening and I was walking around campus and people were taking large benches and setting them on fire. And then people were taking, you know the, you know the aluminum seating you have at, uh, at like soccer games? They were building bonfires and sliding these aluminum seatings into it and then people were running across the top of the aluminum seating and jumping over this large fire. And what I eventually decided to do, it got to the point where people were taking glass beer bottles and throwing them up in the air and letting them come down and shatter. And I was like, I have to leave because it's, I'm just going to, something bad is going to happen, right? Part of me wanted to stay and just observe this silliness, but prudence said it's time to leave. Now, here's the point. We have modern engineering and indoor plumbing and advanced healthcare, and we have all these things. So we have technologies and conveniences, but then the heart of man is just as brutish as it ever was. And you see that manifested. You, you know the, the instances where there'll be some event that happens and then the town decides to riot? That, that's man's nature manifesting itself. It's not, it's always there. It may be below the surface for a period of time, but you, you understand that it's, it's there. It's, it's, it's what mankind is like. So what Ecclesiastes 3.18 is saying, just read the last part of it. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them, that it might make it obvious what man's estate is, and that they might see themselves that they themselves are beasts. In other words, what, what Ecclesiastes is saying is man should realize the truth of what he is, and then that should motivate you then to figure out the answer. There was a book that was popular in the 70s or 80s, and it was called I'm Okay, You're Okay. And the idea was, you know, not perfect, but basically a good person, Mankind is basically good. That's not true, is it? If someone has a sickness, you're better off telling them the truth about it so they can try to address it. You don't do any good by lying to them and telling them everything is okay when everything is not okay. The reality for mankind is everything is not okay. Things are not good, and man needs the grace and forgiveness that is available through Christ. Back to Ecclesiastes 3.19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. 
Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. So what verse 19 says is man has breath like a beast. He's going to die like a beast. He's just a beast. Now I want you to think about one particular clause in verse 19. Here it is. So that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. Now that's not quite right, is it? Get Genesis 1. Get Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So what in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is making the point that man is brutish and he's essentially no different than the beasts. And there's, there's some truth to that in terms of, of man's nature. But he then says, so man hath no preeminence above a beast. And that part is not true. Genesis 1 says that man was given dominion over beasts. Another thing to notice is that men have eternal souls. A beast does not. And we'll, we'll get to that at one point in Ecclesiastes. So what does this tell you? I'm going to read this to you because I, I think this is correct. Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of a wise, observant, accurate, objective, materialist appraisal of life on earth apart from revelation. In other words, if you were to describe life on earth without God's revelation, and you were just trying to tell it as accurately, as objectively, as precisely, based upon what you can see and tell, what you would end up with is Ecclesiastes. And from the materialist perspective, is man really different from a beast? Well, they both die, and it's the end of them. Now, that's not the case spiritually, but from man's materialist perspective, they, they look to be the same. Now, by the way, if you think about that, what, what evolution will tell you is that what is man? He's just a hairless ape, right? He's a little bit more sophisticated. He, he uses tools, but there are some apes that use tools. So all man is, is he's just another beast. He's simply the, the highest one on the food chain, if you will. That is a purely materialistic viewpoint that ignores God's revelation on the matter. Now what, so let me just then say this about Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is telling it like it is apart from Revelation. Let me put it this way. Imagine this with me. What if you, as a thought experiment, just put the Bible out of your knowledge. So you had no knowledge of the scriptures and you just go through life on earth. What would you naturally think and feel? What's the point, right? If there is nothing after this life, if all you are essentially is the earth's crust and water, right? Man was made of the dust of the earth, and your, your body's mostly water, so you're water and dust. You're essentially mud. You're going to be here for a while. 
You can't take anything with you and you just return to the mud of the earth. Well, boy, that's inspirational. It is no surprise that man would live like a beast if what you've convinced him of is he's literally just chemical reactions, right? In other words, he's water and he's minerals, and then there's biochemical reactions that go on inside of him, but there's no spiritual dimension to it. He's just this animal that he's going to just come to an end just like any other brute beast. Well, that, what, uh, what 1 Corinthians 15 says is evil communications corrupt good manners. If you tell people they're beasts, guess what they're going to live like? They're going to live like beasts. It's, it's, it's the natural result of it. What Ecclesiastes does is it tells you how meaningless life is apart from God's revelation. Look at Ecclesiastes 3, verse 20. Ecclesiastes 3, 20. All go unto one place. All are of the dust and all turn to dust again. Well, that's both true and not true. Yes, in the sense of the grave, will every being that has a, a fleshly body decompose and return to dust? Yes, that's true for man and it's true for animals. But it's not true in the sense of eternal destiny. A beast is made to be destroyed, according to Second, per, Second Peter. I don't, there's nowhere in the scripture where a beast has a soul. But what does every man have? Every man has an eternal soul that will continue to exist. Look at Ecclesiastes 3.21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Now, this is sort of fascinating. Get with me Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. What Ecclesiastes 3 said is that the spirit of man goeth upward. So here's what happens at death. Think about this with me. So... Let's draw our old friend. The gingerbread man. Now, so when he dies, what happens to his body? The body goes to dust. In other words, it will it will return to the earth. It will decompose. What happens to the spirit? The spirit, Ecclesiastes 12, says it goeth upward. And it's said to return to God. So what happens at death is the spirit does that. What happens to the soul? Now let's first think about the soul in this context in time past. So before the dispensation of grace. What the soul does is the soul will go down into the earth and it will be either in Abraham's bosom or it will be in hell. But notice here that the spirit part has departed for the Old Testament saying it goeth upward. Now notice with me 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. 
Now what that says there is, is that it's the spirit of man that gives someone the mental capacity to function as a man. In other words, for what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? If the spirit of man departs from him, he's not going to know how to operate as a man. Now, if you recall, go back to Ecclesiastes 3, verse 21 for a minute. I want to show you something. Ecclesiastes 3, 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? If the spirit of a man allows him to know the things of a man, which is what 1 Corinthians 2 says, then the spirit of a beast allows the beast to know the things of a beast. So science has a word called instinct. And whenever science sees an animal do something that they can't explain, they say it's the animal's instinct. Well, okay, let's just go with the biblical term. There's a spirit given to that beast. If you've ever wondered how a homing pigeon, you know, by the way, do you know how they train homing pigeons? I knew a guy that raced homing pigeons. You know how you train homing pigeons? You have a homing pigeon in your home, you drive them an hour away, and you let them out and they fly home. You don't have to train them. In other words, all you have to do is take them far away and they fly home because they know how to do that. You realize there are some teenagers you couldn't do that with, right? If you take them somewhere out there and drop them off, they have no idea where to go, right? What do beavers do? They build dams. They don't have blueprints. How do they do that? They do that because what God did is he designed that beast. He gave that beast a spirit so that a beaver knows how to build a dam. A homing pigeon knows how to fly home no matter where you take them. Now, this will be homework for next week. There's a specific beast in the scripture where God didn't give that beast any sense. Figure out what beast that is. And the point is, what God did is in his wisdom, he decided this beast is going to have the ability to do this. This beast is going to have the ability to do that. And it's going to allow the beaver to perform those things that a beaver can do. And it allows an eagle and you know, all these other animals to do the things that they're able to do. Now, what I want you to just think about for a minute is this. So think about the lost man here. At death, his body goes to the dust, his soul goes to hell. But one thing that happens is what happens to the, his spirit? His spirit leaves. One thing that is perhaps an understated consequence of eternal punishment is that the man loses all mentality of what it means to be a man. Think of it this way. If you think of your body and the tremendous capabilities that it has, so think of just even your hands, right? With your hands, you have incredible dexterity. It allows you to type. It allows you to sew. It allows you to play a harp or to paint. In other words, it allows you to take the God-given intelligence, the wisdom that you have, and express it in creative form. Is that something that God needs the lost man to do for all eternity? It's not. The lost in hell aren't creating works of art. They're not engaging in labor that's glorifying to God. And so what happens is the spirit of the man that allows him to know the things of the man departs. And then 
What is man's body described as when it's in hell? For their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. God's not expecting them to perform acrobatics. He's not expecting them to perform art or music or anything like that. He's just given them a state and a condition where they're capable of receiving punishment for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12, or 22. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 22. Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what shall be after him? Now I want you to notice a contrast. What verse 22 says, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works. Get Ecclesiastes 2, verse 18. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 18. Yea, I hated all my labor, which it I had taken under the sun. Now, do you see how 2.18 contradicts Ephesians, or Ecclesiastes 3.22? Ecclesiastes 3.22, Wherefore I perceive that there is nothing better that a man should rejoice in his own works. Ecclesiastes 3.22 says a man should rejoice in his own works. Ecclesiastes 2.18, Yea, I hated all my labor. What I want you to notice here, I think this is accurate. Maybe someone will correct me. But what you're watching play out in Ecclesiastes is simply this. Solomon, as the wisest man who ever lived, is thinking through how does life on earth work? What should man be doing? Where do we find contentment? But he's doing that search under the sun apart from Revelation. And what you notice, as he writes down his thoughts, they go in circles. They're repetitive. And then he contradicts himself. You know what happens when man searches for meaning apart from God? It's like a dog chasing his tail. Doesn't find anything. Doesn't make progress can't find any meaning there. So I'll just, I'll close with this thought for today. As we go through Ecclesiastes, we're watching this, this spiral, if you will, of confusion, right? Solomon is exploring all these things to find meaning in life, and he just can't find any meaning. And the reason why he can't is he's exploring it in man's wisdom apart from revelation apart from what God has revealed. What that tells us is the importance of the word of God for clarity, stability, meaning in this life. I'll give you an example I see all the time. At the end of Ecclesiastes 1, Paul says where there Let's just read it. Look at Ecclesiastes 1. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 18. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. What he's talking about there is the more that you learn about what goes on the earth, you know what happens? The more sorrowful it is. We think that now is a time of relative peace because there's not a world war going on. But you know what's going on on the earth right now? And I only know a fraction of it. But what's going on on the earth right now is there's places where there's slavery and there's human trafficking that goes on and there's hot wars and there's starvation and there's just all this wickedness. There have been articles recently that Christianity is going to disappear from its birthplace. Then, in other words, when you look at that area of the world where Christianity started, the first, what, what is Paul's base of operations? It's Antioch, right? It's in Syria. And when you look at that region of the world, they're 
prominent folks that have said we're, we're, we're going to see Christianity eliminated from this part of the world. In other words, this world is a total, absolute mess. And if what happens is you spend your time consuming information and learning more about the affairs of this world, what's going to happen? Well, you're just going to have sorrow upon sorrow. So what we need to do is we need to get in this book, which is where encouragement is. Amen? There are times where, as we look at Ecclesiastes, it's going to be really disillusioning, where it's really you know, depressing to read. And the answer to that is to realize that's what man's wisdom is. But we're complete in him. Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. Help us, Lord, to, to glean from Ecclesiastes what you would want us to know. Help us to see the folly of, of human effort, the folly of man's wisdom. Help us to see that peace and joy and contentment and meaning and purpose is in your word and in finding what you would have us to do that would please you. We thank you for what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross in dying for our sins. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.